have to be sort of taken a little better care of. Anguilla, it's called, yeah. and it's near this. Yes, you, you'll see it if you look off. It's a, it's a called Anguilla because it means eel and it's shaped like an eel. Well, I'm afraid there's nothing primitive about this place. No. It's one of the most no. expensive. La Semana is no. one of the most expensive places in the world, not mm -hmm. just the U.S. But it's terrifically good. Mm. We'll start with the. Uh, let's start with the uh, the letter from Herman Perry again, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, then the 2 a.m. phone call and mm -hmm. and Trisha's. Do you mind talking about Trisha as being born in the minks next door? Yeah, we don't want to go too long. I, that's yeah. fine. If and you think it's good. Then we're into the 46th campaign. If it's good. Yeah. And then that's the last. Uh, yeah. Make it You've said that it was a letter that brought you into politics. Is that true? A letter from Herman Perry, who was in college with my mother, Whittier College, uh, who was then the head of the Bank of America branch in Whittier. Uh, w one of the town fathers there, one of those who urged me to run for the state assembly uh, before I came east to go with the OPA. In 1941, before the war. Before the war, 1941. What had happened there was that Gerald Keppel, the assemblyman, uh, was decided uh, had decided not to run because he was going to be appointed to a judgeship. And they looked around and they decided that as a young, coming fellow who was uh, uh, very active in community affairs, that I might be a good candidate. It was it was quite an honor to be asked. And uh, you said yes. No, I said that uh, I'd like to think about it, and then uh, I opted uh, to answer the other letter that I received uh, with, from Tom Emerson with regard to going with the AP OPA. No, I'm sorry. I meant you said yes to the, uh, to oh, the, to the later Perry you. letter. Oh, yes. With the Perry letter, yes. Uh, I called on the phone, as I recall, and uh, he, of course, uh, made it very clear that he didn't have the nomination to offer. Uh, that they had a committee and that you'd have to fly out there to appear before the committee. And then uh, I got to work and wrote letters and all that sort of thing, uh, <laughs> setting up the stage for going before the committee. One of the real problems I had was finding a way to get out there. I was settling these contracts with uh, not only the uh, Martin Aircraft Company, but also with Engineering Research Company. And I was right in the middle of negotiations. and. Uh, Airplane tickets were hard to g come by. And I remember the uh, controller of ERCO, uh, Bill Carroll was his name, uh, said that he'd go down and pick up a ticket for me. Uh, and he went down to the airport, picked up a ticket on uh, one of the airlines to go to California. It was American Airlines, as a matter of fact. Uh, and then uh, he billed me from his credit card when he got the bill. Years later, during the uh, famous fund crisis, uh, one of my critics pointed out that I had borrowed money from a contractor in order to run for Congress, and that's what that's all about. <laughs> was this uh, was the group that Perry represented the Republican organization? No, they were all Republicans, but this was a a committee of 100, as they called them, of citizens getting together uh, who wanted to find a candidate who could beat Jerry Voorhees. Who was uh, the incumbent? Jerry Voorhees was the incumbent. Had been the incumbent for ten years. He had just slaughtered every Republican candidate up to that time, and everyone up to that time had been ultra conservative. Now Perry was a conservative, but he was also a realist. And the other people in this committee, uh, they weren't big businessmen. Basically, they were insurance people, real estate people. Uh, one was an auto dealer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but they were people that knew that you had to have a progressive stance. Uh, in order to beat Jerry Voorhees, even in that district, which was more conservative than Voorhees was. Uh, so consequently, a group of 100 representing the various cities in the district sort of put themselves together. They, and then they proceeded to interview candidates. Of course, one of the apocryphal stories out of that campaign was that this committee put an ad in the paper uh, asking if people wanted to run for Congress and to apply to the committee. There was never any ad. Uh, 
there was a news story to the effect that they were going to interview candidates, and finally six finally showed up uh, in Whittier, uh, appearing before that committee at the William Penn Hotel uh, the night I did, the first night, and it was after that first night that the decision was made, at least I learned it was made, in my favor. How did you hear? Right now. Yep. You can, yeah, matter of fact, you can bring it up. Well, that's Herman, all right. I don't recognize some of the others. Sorry? That's the right one. Gee, what memory. I'm going to ask you uh, how you got the. How did you uh, find out the result of the committee's deliberations? Well, I, when I went out and appeared before the committee, I made a 10-minute speech, as did the other six candidates. Uh, and I was in my uniform, of course, and uh, I did rather well, I, apparently. You made I the was speech, the last speaker. made the speech in, in uniform? Yes. Oh, yes. I didn't have a suit, <laughs> not at that time. Uh, and uh, I flew back to uh, uh, Middle River and to continue with my work for the Navy. And uh, late at night, uh, I had a call from a man that I had met out there, Roy Day, who was the Pomona representative on the ticket, uh, on that committee. And uh, he shouted in the phone. He said, Dick, the nomination is yours. The committee has voted for you so much to so many. I remember it was about three to one. Well, of course, I was very excited, but I hadn't heard from Herman Perry. He was the one that didn't call me. About 10 minutes later, Herman Perry called. He told me the same thing. And incidentally, uh, I practiced then a lesson I learned from my mother many, many years before. I remember once she said that George Washington once said that a gentleman has never heard a joke. And so when Herman told me, it was news. And I have learned that with politics all my life. Uh, somebody will say, you have won this or that or the other thing. And when he thinks he's telling you for the first time, he is, and you must let him think he is. Mm. We have a photograph of some of your uh, early supporters, some of the members of the Committee of 100 in uh, 1946. Yeah, that's Herman Perry right that's, in the middle. That's uh, the man who brought Richard Nixon into politics. He certainly is. He was a marvelous man. He didn't live until I became president, but his son did, Hubert, and it was very active in all my campaigns. Do you recognize any of the other? Uh, I can't from, from here. Uh, Well, him. that one I can pick out. <laughs> but I must say... <laughs> he looks uh, like I'm, a kid. Uh, well, he was. <laughs> 32 at the time. No, I can't remember the others. I can't recall them. There's Chief Newman. I recognize him there in the back row. That was your football and coach. And there's Tom Bewley on his right. Uh, Chief you, uh, is, of course, the swarthy complexion, my football coach. Did he play an active part in campaigning for you? Oh, yes. Uh, he wasn't political. Uh, but on the other hand, the word got around everybody that played at Whittier College, well, Dick's the one, and so forth and so on. And I had a strong group of supporters there, not only in that campaign, but in the Senate campaign, the vice presidential campaigns, presidential campaigns from then on. Was Mrs. Nixon enthusiastic about the possibility of going to Congress? Oh, yes, very much. She was very much for it. Uh, she knew that my interests were in that direction. Uh, she liked adventure. Uh, she thought that uh, it was very important to live an exciting life. And frankly, uh, uh, going to Congress was, would be exciting, she thought. Wasn't Tricia was born just about the time that the campaign Trisha began? Tricia was born in February of the next year. 
And incidentally, it was uh, an occasion that I don't like to be reminded of. Uh, the doctor had told me and her that Tricia would uh, be born uh, in about two days, two or three days. And actually, first babies usually are born late, you know. In this case, she was born a bit early. And I was over in Los Angeles uh, meeting with a group of my political supporters at the University Club in Los Angeles when the telephone rang and you said, uh, you're the father of a baby girl. So I rushed home, but I wasn't there when Trisha was born. Hmm. Mrs. Nixon, I think, helped you in the campaign after... Uh Oh, did she help? She was, uh, we, we had very little money. You see, we weren't the organization candidate. Uh, uh, not that the organization was against us. They didn't have any other candidate. Uh, but this is before the nomination. And she worked in the office. Uh, she did envelopes and uh, passed out literature and all that sort of thing. Uh, she had a very interesting experience, as a matter of fact. Uh, we had <coughs> limited funds, and uh, the... Uh, at uh, one time, somebody came in and took a whole lot of our, uh, of our campaign literature out and then came in and took out some more. We found out that it had just been uh, thrown in the wastebasket. Uh, in other words, it was just one of the opposition playing a prank. Uh, so she watched it very closely after that. She let him have to take only one at a time. Was Voorhees a good congressman? Uh, I thought that he was. He was a very sincere congressman, and incidentally, he was very effective. After Tricia was born, uh, I remember that he uh, sent us a baby book, uh, which was common in those days. I wrote him a little note thanking him for it. Uh, also, I remember seeing him on the House floor, the only time prior to the time my going to Washington as a congressman that I saw the House in session uh, was when I graduated from Duke. Uh, my grandmother came back with my mother and father and two brothers and a Chevrolet car, and the six of us uh, went in that car up to Washington. Uh, I had to get a ticket to get in to see the House of Representatives, and we got it from Jerry Voorhees' office because he was the congressman of the 12th Congressional District in which Whittier was located. I remember we got there late in the afternoon, and there were only four on the floor, which was a shock and a disappointment. I was to learn later that was quite common at the end of the day. And the speaker on that occasion uh, speaking was John Stephen McGroarty, who was sort of a halfway poet and so forth, who was a, a liberal congressman from California, a Democrat, who was for the Townsend Plan. It's only my old man was for the Townsend Plan, too, because he believed that it was very important to do something about older people in their retired years. One of the few listening was a young congressman, the Jerry Boris, that I had met in Jack Petit's barn uh, just uh, three, uh, two years before that. And I remember so well after John C. McGordy finished his speech and the speaker said the House will now stand in recess until 12 o'clock tomorrow, that Varhees gathered up a whole lot of papers that he was working on all the way, all the time, stayed there to hear his colleague finish his speech, and he went walking out of the room, uh, the chamber, very, very speedily. And I sort of thought, well, there is a very conscientious man. Hmm. Now, Varhees was a very decent man. Uh, his problem was he wasn't effective. And his political problem was he was a liberal, ultra-liberal as a matter of fact, in a relatively conservative district. And that was the fundamental reason why in 1946 he lost. There were other reasons, but that was the main one. How'd you beat him? Well, first, uh, in all uh, fairness to him, uh, the tide was running in our favor. It's very possible that, that uh, I would have won if I hadn't campaigned at all. Uh, although I doubt it, because uh, he was very good at constituent relations. N not only baby books to me, but agriculture books to the farmers and all that sort of thing and so forth and so on. He handled his mail very well. He always answered it. He was good to his constituents. But I think what happened uh, that really gave me the lift was that after the primary, when he was substantially ahead of me, since we were both filing on both tickets, we could tell uh, who was ahead. Uh, that after that, uh, I challenged him to debate. Uh, the way it came about is that we were invited to a joint appearance before one group, and then I, after that debate, which is in South Pasadena, the League of Women Voters, I challenged him to more. We had three more. They drew increasingly great crowds, and in debate, first, it created interest in the campaign. Second, it made me known, 
And up to that point, he was more better known than I was. He should never have accepted the challenge, incidentally, from a political standpoint, but he was good sport enough to do it. And uh, third, uh, it enabled me uh, to point up what were our real differences, which were philosophical. Uh, he was pro-labor in a district that was not anti-labor, but uh, thought that the labor laws, as I did, uh, had to be modified to an extent to avoid some of the very terrible strikes that came immediately after the war. He was, uh, he had been a, a socialist years before, and that was reflected in his thinking. Uh, he was for more and more government enterprise, and I was more for private enterprise. Uh, I think, however, the advantage I have over those who had previously run against Voorhees was that I was not, uh, did not portray myself and did not believe that I uh, uh, held a point of view uh, which was reactionary. Uh, uh, I think I was in the mold of my father. I was an activist. I was progressive, uh, conservative, uh, but with the belief that uh, government had to act where people could not act for themselves. And I think that gave him not as easy a target to shoot at had I just been a hard right, uh, frankly, dull conservative. Uh, whatever people said about me, I was not dull. Uh, and I've often said when people say, well, uh, what does a candidate have to have? Uh, let me say, don't be wrong on an issue if you can avoid it. But there's one thing worse than being wrong on an issue, and that is to be dull. Didn't the, uh, who's the dullest man in politics? The dullest man who succeeded in politics. <clears throat> I don't think I'm able to, to uh, answer that question. The dullest man who could succeeded in politics. I don't think I have a good answer to that. Who's the most exciting man who's in these terms? Today, you mean? Mm, or in your, in, your, in your experience? Well, Franklin Roosevelt was exciting. Uh, Dewey tended to be dull, not as when he ran for governor, but when he ran for president. Uh, Taft did not excite people except his own partisans. Uh, uh, Eisenhower was exciting, the mystique, uh, uh, the flashing blue eyes, that great smile and so forth. He was exciting. H his ideas were not particularly exciting. Uh, Kennedy was exciting because he was able to run against uh, things as they were and for the new frontier and uh, a lot of other things, of course, and that sort of thing. Uh, Johnson was not dull. Goldwater was not dull. In fact, Goldwater went to the other extreme. He, he was so reckless and so unpredictable and so, so brutally honest sometimes that uh, he practically killed himself. I mean, my goodness, he goes down to the Tennessee Valley and they say, what do you want to do about the TVA? And he says, sell it. Uh, he goes down to uh, appear in St. Petersburg before a group of senior citizens. What are you going to do with Social Security? He says, make it voluntary. Uh, he. Uh, uh, was asked about what uh, should be done about uh, dealing with the Russians. Uh, he said, well, when they ought, they get out of line, we just ought to lob one into the men's room at the Kremlin. And uh, when uh, people said, what are you going to do about the situation in Europe? He said, we ought to give our field commanders in Europe uh, the right on their own uh, if they feel they need to, to use nuclear weapons without having to get approval by the President of the United States. Now, that's what things that he believed. But it was devastating because it made him appear to be reckless and therefore dangerous. And Johnson, a master politician, played that up to the hilt. The, uh, the 1946 race was, I think, uh, listed by the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee as the second longest shot of all the congressional races in the country. Did you have the sense at the time that it was <coughs> an impossible, a mission impossible? Well, I did, except. Uh, for the fact that uh, Herman Perry and my other good friend said, look, Dick, uh, this district is not a Voorhees district. The problem is we just haven't had good enough candidates. If you're a good enough candidate, if you work hard enough, you can beat them. Uh, and uh, so that's what happened. How did you uh, get funding? Money was one of the hardest things. Uh, the biggest contribution, you know, in these days of these hundred thousand dollar dinners and million dollar dinners and million dollar campaigns even for the house. The biggest contribution we had was five hundred dollars in that campaign. 
Uh, our total, the total we expended in both the primary and the final was $37,000. It proved to be enough because in those days we didn't have any television. Uh, very little radio was used because that was a district which was too broad. It, you couldn't, it, radio cost you too much if you had to emanate out of L.A. to cover the 12th district. Uh, so uh, consequently it didn't cost as much as it did. Travel, I just traveled in my own car. Uh, uh, mainly you, you had literature. As a matter of fact, one of the most effective things we had in that California, I remember Harrison McCall, my campaign manager, came on one day and in those days you used to give out fingernail files and blotters and other things, little gimmicks, you know, to voters. Uh, and he said, I got something new here and he showed me a thimble. He said, why don't we give these out? He says, I can get 500 of them. And so I, we wrote on there, put the needle in the PAC, vote for Nixon. And uh, it cost us $500. Uh, I thought it was a rather foolish expense. It was the best expense we ever made. It became the symbol of that campaign and later on the symbol in the campaign we used in 1950. But I, I must say that I had there one of the most uh, <laughs> memorable and uh, I would hope m uh, forgettable con uh, contacts or incidents of all. Running in another district, also considered to be relatively hopeless, was Don Jackson over in the 16th district around Santa Monica. Uh, the, the, this is a district, for example, in the assembly that is represented by uh, Hayden, Jane Fonda's uh, husband in the state assembly in California. But in any event, uh, Jackson, whom I had met when Charlie Halleck came out to address some of the new candidates in Southern California, uh, was a Marine veteran and uh, a very uh, much man of the world, uh, etc. Uh, he liked the girls and they liked him. Uh, in any event, Jackson called me one day and he said, Dick, he said, you got money problems, I got money problems. I just had a very interesting letter from one of my constituents. He says, he's got a scheme, he's been following both you and me, and uh, he believes that we're the young people of the future. He's got a scheme, he says, where he can finance our whole campaign. I said, well, I don't know. Uh, he said, but this is in a very good district, a very good area. He must have the dough. So I drove over one day. So Jackson and I went to call on this fellow about uh, 6 o'clock at night. And I remember it was over in Beverly Hills, uh, a gated uh, lot, uh, perhaps a big house on about two acres. Uh, we went in. It, it sort of reminded me uh, of the house in Sunset Boulevard. Uh, rather run down. In the film. Yes, the film, uh, Sunset Boulevard. Uh, it was rather run down. It was a love, it looked like another era. Uh, we knocked on the door. A butler came to the door, bowed, uh, uh, let us in. It had that musty smell and feel of great wealth that had sort of fallen on bad days. And yet we met the man. Uh, he was wearing, I remember, a very, very <laughs> handsome smoking jacket. Uh, he was very proper. He shook her hand. We came in, took us into a big library. I remember there were books on all sides, very impressive. And we sat in front of an open fire, and then he began to tell us how he was going to finance our campaigns. Unfortunately, we found within a few minutes he, he was a funny money man. Uh, he thought that if you just printed enough money that that and distributed it to enough people, that that would mean that. Uh, uh, the, the economy would get going and things would be settled from then on out. Uh, Jerry Vorey, incidentally, had written a book not as exaggerated as that, and he was also called a funny money man, uh, which I used to point out in our debates on occasion. If I didn't, the questioners would, my conservative question. But in any event, he went on and on about this scheme, and he says, you know, if you two fellows have pushed this, he says, I am sure the word will get around and others like myself, et cetera, uh, will make contributions to your campaign. Just as he was going into this and getting more and more enthusiastic and I was stealing a look at Jackson and Jackson at me, wondering how are we going to get out of there, in walked the butler. He had a 45 pistol. He pointed at this guy and he said to me and he turned to us, he says, young fellows, do you know who this fellow is? Don't you have a thing to do with the son of a bitch? He's no good. He's murdered two wives already. And then he waved the pistol around in our direction, too. And we began to feel a little bit. And then this fellow said, George, quiet down now, quiet down now. He said, oh, no, no, you know what you did. You poisoned the first one and the second one. 
you made her take an enema, and you kept the enema going until it burst her, her belly. My God, we wondered what this is all about. So George, don't do this. And so finally Jackson and I sort of gradually eased up, keeping our eye on him, backing out of the room, and we said, we, maybe we'll see you another time we should talk. He got out of the room. We got out of the door, and we were both perspiring on a very cool evening. And Jackson said, I think we need a drink. And I said, fine, let's go to your place. He said, oh, no, let's go to a bar. I said, to a bar? I said, I wouldn't think of going to a bar during a campaign, not in the 12th district. He says, well, in the 16th district, we campaign in bars. So we went to the closest bar. We both had a double scotch. <laughs> Did uh, you mentioned the, uh, the thimbles put a needle in the pack. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. uh, raises one of the most controversial uh, issues, controversial yeah. issues uh, of that campaign and of your subsequent career, the, uh, the political action committee, mm -hmm. the PAC. What, what was it? Basically, here was the problem. Uh, Jerry Voorhees and his previous campaigns always had the support of organized labor. Uh, organized labor, the CIO, uh, had a political action committee. But in this campaign, when he knew he was going to have a formidable op opposition, uh, uh, the word got, he got the word to these people, even though he had a 100% pro-labor voting record, that he, it wouldn't be helpful to have their endorsement. What did the political action so committee the do? Oh, the, oh, handed out money to candidates and, pro and provided uh, precinct workers for them. Now, that was not particularly a labor district, but the dough was very, very important, uh, and so forth. Any event, when uh, uh, the the CIO PAC therefore did not endorse him, didn't oppose him, didn't endorse me, you can be sure. But the National Citizens uh, Political Action Committee, uh, which was broader than Labor, uh, and in which, uh, uh, as it later was revealed, there were so many fellow travelers and some even communists involved in that, it did endorse him. And uh, the word got out that he was endorsed, and it even appeared in the Communist Daily World in Los Angeles uh, that he had been endorsed by the National Citizens Political Action Committee. So in our first debate, uh, Vary said that I was misrepresenting him when I said he was, endor I said he was endorsed by the PAC. But I, then I took this uh, flyer that had been sent out by the National Citizens Politi uh, Political Action Committee, and I took it over and showed it to him and then showed it to the audience, and I said, what about that, Congressman? And he got up and said, but this is the National Citizens PAC. This is a different one from the CIO PAC. But they had, in most uh, cases, the same officers. They had the same goals. And the point was, they were both on the liberal side. And uh, I had made the point, and he had made it by not being able to deny he was endorsed by that one. Although he later asked them to withdraw their endorsement, too. But it was too late. How important was that issue? to the outcome of that campaign? As it turned out, not too important, because Voorhees' record on labor, uh, Voorhees' record on uh, social spending and everything else was on the left. And, my, and our views were just different. He was a very honest liberal uh, on the left, and I was, frankly, a very honest uh, conservative, I would say a fairly progressive one, uh, uh, on the right. Uh, and that was the clash. And another thing, I think the key, key issue, which Voorhees very honestly uh, pointed out in his book written after the campaign, uh, the key issue was this. Uh, the Republican campaign slogan nationwide that year was had enough, had enough of controls, uh, had enough of rationing and all that sort of thing. And Voorhees had to defend those controls, the Truman administration and what had been imposed. I could attack. People wanted a change. They had had enough. That was the real reason that Voorhees lost, that I won, and the real reason I think that Jackson won in the 16th, and that we had enough wins to have the historic change of over 50 votes in the House, which won both the House and the Senate in 1946. At what? Effectiveness. It has to do with effectiveness. Uh, we're coming up to uh, this one shortly.
ask you about the debates and then about the House meetings and then, right. go, to, and then mm -hmm. go to the results and then go to Herder. That's right. Or then go to uh, Kent, uh, yeah. Keysport. Okay, do you again? Okay. Okay. In the debates, didn't you particularly challenge him on the subject of his effectiveness as a congressman for the district? Well, as a matter of fact, even before the debates, uh, I had studied his record very, very carefully. And I found that while he'd introduced a great number of bills, even though he was a member of the majority party and had been in Congress 10 years, he hadn't gotten many through. In fact, I could find only one. Uh, and uh, it, it was, and so consequently, based on that research, which I had done very, very carefully, uh, we got out a postcard. We sent out, I mailed about 25,000 of those, which said, uh, your congressman over the past 10 years has introduced over 300 uh, bills, I think that was the number, uh, of which only one was passed. That one transferred jurisdiction over rabbits from the, uh, com uh, from the, uh, Department of Interior to the Department of Agriculture. Well, that had a devastating effect, and so it naturally became a subject in the debate. And uh, the point uh, had to be made by Boris and his opponents that that was a misrepresentation of his record. Well, in fact, it was accurate. That was the only public bill that did get passed. Uh, and uh, so, uh, we were able to quip at times, uh, in order to get representation from the 12th district, you got to be a rabbit. <laughs> Incidentally, the reason that he did that, however, in all uh, honesty, and the reason it had some effect on that district is that in that period, many people out on that district, which was about half rural, at that point were raising rabbits, uh, rabbits to be sold, and rabbit skin and furs and so forth and so on. It was quite a drill for a while. and. Uh, so, uh, which reminds me, incidentally, that uh, while we didn't have the rabbit problem uh, when after Tricia was born, we had the problem with minks uh, because they also tried to raise minks out there. Any any way to to get a few extra bucks? I remember we had a we had a tiny little house that we lived in uh, when we were campaigning in that period, right after Tricia was born, and. Uh, I helped Pat by doing the two o'clock feeding at times. You get up, and Trisha was was a one that was was a very good baby. Uh, but once she was awake at two, she wanted to stay the rest of the night. And I'd walk and walk, and then finally, when I thought she was asleep, I'd sort of tiptoe back and slip her down in the crib, and then try to sneak back to bed, and Wah! and up she would go. And the other thing that kept her awake were the minks. Our neighbors next door were raising minks. Uh, I think there was a city ordinance again, but that didn't seem to bother them. And, uh, you know, minks uh, may make a beautiful coat, uh, but minks as animals are among the most repulsive animals. They stink, uh, they eat their young, uh, they squeal, uh, and the squealing used to keep us awake. Uh, anyway, getting back to Boris and the rabbits, I would say that he, uh, this was very effective. Uh, and uh, I felt a little sorry for him because I knew he had worked hard. And it isn't uh, a case in 435 members of the House, how many bills did you get through? Uh, maybe you affect legislation in other ways as well. But it was one dramatic way to point out that he wasn't a very influential congressman. Was it a dirty campaign? Oh, no. In sense of being tough and rough? Oh, no. And no, 
No, it was very gentlemanly. As a matter of fact, I remember when our debate took place at Bridges Hall at Pomona College. We had over 1,500, and it's a beautiful auditorium. And that, of course, was his home turf. And I remember that uh, on that occasion, uh, in my concluding remarks during the debate, I said, you know, this district has been represented over the past 10 years by a man who's very sincere, who's very able, and who I am sure has been working and voting in, uh, for causes that he deeply believes in. And the Voorhees supporters, and there were about as many of his there as mine, cheered a bit and so forth. Uh, afterwards, some of my hard-line supporters just ate my tail off. They said, you shouldn't have said those nice things about him. He didn't say anything nice about you. And I said, look, we're in his territory. We're probably going to win more being honest about what a good man he is and then cut him up uh, where he's wrong. Uh, so that was the kind of a campaign it was. Voorhees, incidentally, in, on his part, may I say, uh, he was not a vicious man. Uh, he was a gentleman. Uh, and uh, uh, he defended his record very vigorously, uh, but on the other hand, uh, he was running against the tide that year. There was no way uh, that he could win. And may I say, in 1946, as far as the Republicans are concerned, we elected a lot of good people in that great Republican tide, uh, but also a lot of good Democrats. Uh, I'm not including Boris in that at the moment, except that because he was representing a district which was different from his views, but a lot of good Democrats went down. There was nothing they could do, and we elected a few turkeys uh, who were later defeated, of course, in either 48 or 50. The story has come down from that campaign, one of the most controversial legacies from it, that uh, just before ele the election, or on the election eve, uh, anonymous, uh, very late at night, anonymous phone calls were made to Vori's supporters, uh, and with the message, just Ver Jerry Vori's is a communist, and then hanging up, and it's been attributed to your supporters. Well, I, first, I would say our supporters had nothing to do with it. I uh, certainly knew nothing about it, uh, would have disapproved if it had happened. But second, uh, uh, assuming that people aren't going to believe you when you say you knew, didn't know about it, let me say communism was not the issue in that campaign. Uh, there were domestic issues that were involved. Foreign policy, I don't remember being discussed significantly in that, came what, uh, that campaign, whatever. Uh, I think that uh, I remember the only time that we really discussed communism was at the second debate before the American Legion in Whittier. Uh, Boris was a member of the Committee on Un-American Activities, and the question came up uh, about the committee. And I remember I talked about the need to have fair procedures, uh, and Boris agreed. Uh, but otherwise, uh, there was no discussion of communism. How now, there isn't any question, let me say, uh, that the uh, National Citizens Political Action Committee had heavy infiltration by communists and fellow travelers. Uh, even the objective observers on the left have had to admit that. Uh, Boris himself, there was never any question about his being communist. He had been a socialist, uh, but he certainly, uh, nobody could make the other charge. How did he reconcile being a uh, thoroughgoing liberal with being on the House on American Activities Committee? Well, because uh, they wanted somebody on that committee that would be a counterpoise for the Martin Dyes and some of the nuts uh, on the other side. What did communism mean as an issue in American politics at that time in the immediate post-war period? Uh, communism at that time uh, primarily meant uh, just being on the left, it meant for uh, it meant Marxism basically. It meant uh, it meant uh, all-out socialism. It meant uh, government control of the economy. It, it did not mean, as it did later, uh, that it was uh, uh, related to control by and supported by a foreign power and a potential enemy, the Soviet Union. That was not the issue in that those early years, because at that point. Uh, uh, until Churchill's uh, famous Iron Curtain speech began to stir people up and get them to feel about it, there, there wasn't that anti-Soviet feeling. Uh, uh, wasn't it in this campaign that you pioneered the technique of house meetings? I did. As a matter of fact, uh, I got to thank Boris for that, I think, because Jack Petit had had a meeting in his barn, which was in effect uh, his house, his playroom, so to speak, and just and I liked the format. I remember how impressive it was for me to meet a man running for Congress, 
uh, and it turned out to be an excellent forum for me for two reasons. One, uh, I developed supporters there that have been supporters throughout my political career, friends and s as well as supporters. Two, it gave me a chance to see what people really were thinking. Uh, from their questions, I could tell what was concerning them. And three, it sharpened me up, uh, sharpened me up for the debates, uh, having to answer questions by very intelligent people. You see, this district was considerably above the average in intelligence. There were f four colleges. There was uh, in the district, Laverne, and Whittier, and, and uh, of course, uh, Pomona. And uh, there were, uh, it was relatively high income in certain parts, uh, for example, San Marino, uh, South Pasadena. And so uh, it was a pretty good test of a young man who had never been in politics before, 32 years of age, uh, to go before those groups and get asked questions about the economy, about the budget, and so forth and so on. It was a great education. We talked about your sense of uh, privacy and uh, uh, your lack of sales manic uh -huh. tendencies, temperament. Uh, were you embarrassed to ask people for their votes to uh, sell yourself in that uh, first political context? I didn't. Uh, I, I developed a different technique. Uh, I did not ask people to vote for me. I asked people to vote for the cause that I believe in. Uh, and that is the technique I use throughout my political career. Uh, I, I think, uh, for example, in when I ran for re-election uh, or in, in other times, you will never see a case where I said, it, uh, where I in effect say, vote for me because of what I can do for you or something like that. It was in terms that I support these views. If you support these views, if you believe this district needs better representation, if you believe in these issues, then I am your man. If not, somebody else is your man. And if you read all my speeches, you'll find that is the theme. When I ran for the House, when I ran for the Senate, when I was campaigning with Eisenhower, when I campaigned for the presidency, I would advise that uh, to other young people, too. Uh, it, it always has turned me off to see somebody come in and stick his chest out and say, vote for me for Congress. I'm the best man. It just turned me off. Did you think you were going to win? No. I didn't, I wasn't uh, too hopeful. We did, there were no polls then, uh, not in that district at least. Uh, I, I was encouraged by the enthusiasm, however. The enthusiasm of the crowds I was addressing. Uh, I was encouraged by the increasing turnouts at the debate. There was enormous interest in the campaign. Uh, the last debate that we had in the San Gabriel uh, Mission Playhouse, uh, I recall uh, they had over a thousand outside listening by radio when we were debating inside. A and I felt that I had done, I had held my own, which is all I needed to do against him in that district, and perhaps bested him a bit, although it was very close. It wasn't a case of his getting wiped out. He was very effective. Was he a good deba debater? Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. He's a highly intelligent man. A real test for me. But you did win. What was, what I was won your first election of, night like? Oh, I remember it very, very well. Roy Day, uh, who was quite a man about town, had uh, invited me uh, to have dinner with him at the Tail of the Cock restaurant. That was his favorite. It was over in Los Angeles someplace, I think in Beverly Hills. And so we had dinner early, and he said, you know, you're not going to get the return from the 12th district to very late, because you know you have paper ballots in California. And so you can have district and get home and listen to the rest of them with Pat. So as we were driving home, he had on the car radio. And all of a sudden, on the car radio, we heard the reports about the uh, gubernatorial race, where uh, uh, War, uh, Bory, I mean, where Warren was running off with it, had, as a matter of fact, already run off with it, uh, uh, because uh, uh, having won in both primaries. But Nolan was winning for the Senate, and he was up that year. And then, all of a sudden, they began to go through the congressional districts. So he tuned up the radio, the volume, the 12th district. Nixon, 536, Voorhees, 386. And they yelped and almost hit the curb. I said, I, I'm afraid that's just from San Marino. Of course, that was our most uh, uh, Republican part of the district. But the trend held, and we won very decisively, about 64,000 to 47,000. Hmm. Did uh, Voorhees conceded? And, uh, yes, uh, he conceded. Uh, uh, 
he was not happy about conceding. It's difficult to. Uh, in fact, he, he made a rather, rather sad speech in a way. He said, I have given the best ten years of my life uh, to my country, uh, but this district, my constituents have decided otherwise, and so forth and so on. Uh, and uh, I didn't receive a uh, letter from him or a call. Uh, but afterwards, when I went to Washington, he invited me to come by his office as he was closing it up. And uh, I remember sitting there and talking to him about the problems of the district and so forth. He was a gentleman. How did it feel to be the new congressman, the new Republican congressman from the 12th district at age 32? Well, as you know, I've won a few, uh, lost a few, but you remember the ones you won. Uh, I won for the House, won for the Senate, twice for vice president, and twice for president. But believe me, there's nothing to equal the first time. And being the congressman at 32 years of age, and for Pat and for me, I think that was the top. Uh, even more so, the only thing next to it, I say, would be the presidency in 68. Uh, that in its way, of course, nothing could be higher than that. But that first win for Congress was the one that left the most lasting and uh, I would say most memorable uh, recollection with us. How did you celebrate it? You know what we did? We went around uh, to the various parties that were being held in the district uh, by those that had had house meetings for us. We couldn't go to all, of course. Uh, but I remember we went to Alhambra, we went to Pomona. Uh, we, we, we went all over the district. And we got into the last one about 2 o'clock in the morning, and they were still celebrating. Uh, but uh, uh, in those cases, well, and, and, and that time, they were all, frankly, having a a drink now and then, uh, even in that district, which was considerably dry insofar as open bars were concerned, people did drink at home. And that was one night when everybody had something. When you We didn't, uh, excuse me. When you got to Washington, one of the other uh, members of the freshman class elected in 1946 was John Kennedy of Massachusetts. Did you have any dealings or contact with him as fellow freshmen? Uh, a substantial number. Uh, considering the fact that he was a Democrat and I was a Republican. One of the reasons was that uh, we were both put on the Labor Committee, and uh, we had to draw straws to see who had, uh, among the new members of the Congress, who uh, had the seniority. Uh, and he drew the last straw on the Democratic side, and I drew the last straw on the Republican side. So uh, we were, and when questioning came, uh, when we were developing the uh, Taft-Hartley bill or when we were investigating communism and labor unions and so forth. By the time the questioning came to us, virtually all the good questions had been asked. But we were both pretty sharp, and uh, he would come up with some good questions, and I usually did, and consequently uh, we'd get together in our offices from time to time and discuss uh, how we could do well the next hearing around. It turned out, incidentally, of course, we differed on that act. Uh, he, coming from a heavily pro-labor a district voted against the Taft-Hartley bill and also uh, voted against overriding President Truman's uh, veto. Uh, I voted for it. Uh, I did not take an extreme position on the Taft-Hartley bill. As a matter of fact, I supported the position of Senator Taft, uh, which buffered down some of the more extreme uh, p positions uh, of the Hartley bill. George McKinnon, who later went to the Circuit Court of Appeals in uh, Washington, D.C., still there. Uh, and I worked very effectively, incidentally, on Section 14B. A lot of technical things we can't get into here. Did you see in John Kennedy at that time someone with a major political future? Did he seem to be different from the other freshmen in the class? I don't know as I really thought of that, but I could see that he was very intelligent. Uh, he was very intelligent. He was very personable. Uh, However, I, I sensed that he was very shy, uh, frankly, as I was. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I rather thought that we were alike in that respect. We were very different in many ways. Uh, but uh, he had a very great sense of privacy. I think that's one of the reasons uh, perhaps we hit it off rather well. I remember one night, for example, that Eunice Kennedy, his, uh, his older sister, who was not married then, uh, had a dinner uh, at her house where he was there and I was there. Uh, and a few of the other young members of Congress. And we talked far, far into the night, not incidentally about 
uh, domestic issues where we would totally disagree in many cases like on Taft-Hartley, but about foreign policy where Kennedy and I saw the world pretty much alike. Uh, he was anti-communist, I was anti-communist. He was for foreign aid under proper circumstances, I was. He was for reciprocal trade and I was. We had a lot of things in common. There's a photograph of the two of you taken at uh, that time. You both look about 12 years old. Well, he was very young looking, and of course he was about three years younger than I. I was 33 by that time, and he was about 29 or so. Uh, we were both thin, <laughs> and he remained that way, and I've taken on a little more weight. Uh, but let's face it, we were young. and. Uh, I remember, the thing I remember about Kennedy more than anything else in that period was uh, when we debated. Now the first debate was not in the 60 campaign where 70 million people listened to the first presidential debate on television, but the first one is a little town called McKeesport, Pennsylvania. A silver-haired congressman, Democratic congressman from that district, uh, very much of a go-getter, uh, by his local chamber of commerce had been asked to get a couple of young congressmen to come up and debate the Taft-Hartley Act. And uh, he talked to me and talked to Kennedy and we both agreed to go. I don't know why we did it, but you know, we didn't get that many invitations in those days and uh, there was no honorarium. And so we went up and uh, we debated before the chamber of commerce. I think I had a little bit better of it because I think the chamber of commerce audience was more on my side. Uh, but be that as it may, it was very friendly and gentlemanly and we expressed our differences of opinion on the Taft-Hartley Act. We went back by train to Washington from McKeesport. It was a night train because we had to get back for a vote the next day. And uh, so we drew for who got the upper berth and who got the lower berth. And I won one of the few times I did against him. I got the lower berth, but it didn't make a lot of difference because all night long, I recall, going back in the train, we talked about our experiences, uh, in the past, but particularly about the world and uh, where we were going and that sort of thing. Uh, I, I recall that was the occasion too, as we're going back in that train week, I told him about my having been stationed at Bella Lavella and found that his PT boat had put in there and we reminisced about whether we possibly might have met on that occasion. So we just assumed we did. You were assigned to the uh, House Labor and Education Committee, but you were also assigned to a second committee, the House on American Activities Committee, which was exceptional for a freshman. Why was that? Well, Joe Martin was the one that made those assignments. Joe Martin was the speaker, and the committee had a fairly bad reputation at that point, being extreme, being reckless, and so forth. Was it deserved? Uh, some of it was, yes, uh, in my view. Uh, but uh, uh, on the other hand, Joe Martin felt that they needed a, a lawyer on the committee, and I was a young lawyer, and as a matter of fact, as it turned out on the Republican side, I was the only lawyer on the committee. Uh, Pardell, Thomas, Carl Munt, uh, McDowell uh, were not lawyers. Uh, I don't mean by that that lawyers cannot also be extreme and irresponsible, because God knows they can be. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, he put me on it for that reason. I wasn't keen about doing it, incidentally. I didn't ask for the committee, uh, but he asked me to go on it, and I said, all right, I'll go on it. And he also, I think, put me on because Voorhees had been on it. See, Voorhees had been on it as a Democrat. The Democrats lost the Congress, and so there was an extra seat on our side. So I think he sort of got a kick out of putting me on it uh, to replace Voorhees, because he was not a Voorhees man. While Voorhees, Voorhees was not as unpopular, for example, as Helen Gahagan Douglas, who turned off both Republicans and Democrats, except those that were very liberal. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, his sort of what they called fuzzy uh, liberalism turned off conservative Republicans, and they sort of considered me to be a giant killer, and I think that's one of the reasons I got on the committee. Shortly after you arrived in Washington, you uh, were with a group, small group of congressmen that went to the Oval Office to visit President Truman which I guess was the first time you had met him person yes. uh, in a small group or personally, mm -hmm. the first time you'd been in the White House. Do you remember it what It may the, have uh, been the first time, it may not have been, because I remember very shortly after we came there uh, that uh, the Trumans had uh, a reception for all the members of Congress. And I remember Pat on that occasion, uh, with our limited funds, uh, bought a new dress, a long dress, and uh, we thought it was worthwhile because, as she said, you said, you know, this may be the only time we'll ever be in the White House. 
so it's probably worth it. And I remember when we went through the line, Truman and Mrs. Truman did it very automatically. They grab your, they, they, the aide would stand here, Congressman Nixon, and they took the hand and he'd push you on to Mrs. Truman. He'd push them on to Mrs. Truman. He was, but he was gra gracious. Later on that year was when I went to the Oval Office. That was arranged by Charlie Kirsten from Wisconsin, a good friend of mine who was always uh, thinking of something. For example, uh, he even had the gall uh, <coughs> when I was a member of the Committee of American Acti on American Activities. He was very interested in communism at home and abroad and so forth. Uh, he got the two of us appointments with the Hungarian ambassador, uh, with the Polish ambassador, uh, and with the Czechoslovakian ambassador from the Iron Curtain countries. Nobody ever saw them, the people administration, because that was the time of the Cold War, but they received us and we had a good go with them, so we learned a little about Eastern Europe at that time. But in any event, uh, he asked the White House for an appointment for these three young congressmen. I don't know why Truman ever did it. I, I don't know why his uh, staff let him do it, because I think of my own period, if three Democratic congressmen, I would see, it, I just had, didn't have even have time to see the senior ones. I saw most of them, but to get a junior Democratic congressman in and see him, it was just unheard of. But he was very gracious. He was very warm, and I remember vividly that he took us over to uh, the globe. He had a big globe in the office, and he'd, he pointed out China and pointed out the importance of China for the future, and he pointed out Europe and so forth. Uh, and it was, if to use a pun, it was quite clear that he had a global, uh, shall we say, grasp of affairs at that point. But what impressed me the most was that he was down to earth, very direct, and very cordial to three Republican congressmen, uh, which may prove that he was a pretty good politician, too. He realized that he didn't control the Congress, and he thought maybe he was going to get a little support here or mute our opposition. Do you remember what it felt like to cross the threshold of the Oval Office for the first time? Well, it's like going into uh, a great cathedral for the first time. Uh, it, uh, it, you're always in awe of that place. Joe Martin, who was the Speaker of the House, uh, gave you another surprise shortly with the appointment to the Herder Committee, which turned out to be a very uh, an important step in your career and really your first opportunity to exercise your interest in foreign affairs. D why did he appoint you? I have the Do slide. You know? <laughs> I don't know. Again, I think uh, I had made a fairly good impression. I had beaten the giant clear killer. Uh, my first speech, my maiden speech in the House of Representatives was, was pretty successful. Uh, it was only a 10-minute speech, but uh, uh, Gerhard Eisler, a top communist functionary in the United States, uh, had refused to testify before the committee, uh, and uh, we cited him for contempt and asked the House, of course, to vote contempt, and they did overwhelmingly. So I had a pretty, uh, pretty easy ta task doing it, but I made uh, apparently quite an effective speech. So. I was considered to be a cut above the others. I wasn't really, but, but, but it was because of who I had beaten and opportunities that were presented to me. And so the way I heard about this, I was reading the Washington Star one afternoon. And to my amazement, it said, the following have been appointed to members of the Herder Committee to go to Europe, and I saw my name. He didn't even tell me about it, you know, which speaks a lot for him. Usually the speaker in this case would have called you and says, Dick, you know, I want to do a great favor for you. But Joe wasn't that way. He did it, and later I thanked him for it, and he says, well, you deserved it. Do a good job. Boom. What was Joe Martin like? Joe was a uh, very down-to-earth, uh, kind of Irish brogue, uh, uh, but with a very good political sense. Not exciting, not combative. Uh, I remember, I think what I remember him most for was uh, what he told Eisenhower very early on in one of the legislative leaders' meetings. Uh, a very tough bill was coming up, and, uh, and uh, Eisenhower's legislative uh, representative uh, was, uh, you know, from the White House, was uh, giving the rundown on the vote. Uh, and uh, the rundown uh, w was approximately 100 in, in the House, was 180 uh, for the Eisenhower pr proposal uh, and about 180 against it. Uh, and the rest undecided. And so uh, uh, Eisenhower said, well, that looks pretty good then. And Joe says, no, it doesn't, Mr. President. He says, 
with that Irish burr of his when, when they say that they're undecided, he said, uh, they're just trying to be nice to you. You can figure that they're in the other side. <laughs> we lost the vote, too. He was right. He was right. What was the Herder Committee meant to do? The Herder Committee was established to go to Europe uh, to study the economic conditions in Europe, to make recommendations to what was then a very isolationist House of Representatives for foreign aid, implementing the Marshall Plan. Uh, it was, of course, a great opportunity for me and for every member of the committee. Uh, it was my first trip to Europe. We have some photographs, uh, snapshots, that were taken by committee members. This looks like a That's Venice. George Mahon. I know him very well. Scene. He, incidentally, uh, worked with me later when I was president. He was chairman of the uh, Armed Forces Committee, a fine man from Texas. Uh, and that is taken, of course, in Venice. Uh, it was uh, quite a trip. Oh, this one I recognize very well. Uh, this one was taken uh, on a plane, a DC-3 plane, where we were going from Athens up to the northern part of Greece uh, to visit uh, an area that at that time was being attacked by the communist Greek guerrillas. And uh, it was quite a hairy flight, incidentally. What did you find when you got there? You were up actually in the battle lines, or? Well, we were very close to it. We primarily got a chance to uh, interview people who had either been captive. Uh, in other words, we, we interviewed some captive guerrillas, uh, and they told us how they were pressed into service by the communists, threatened blackmail, and so forth and so on. A and one particularly uh, very shocking and moving event uh, I'll never forget it, was when uh, we talked to one young fellow who, who told us about his sister. He said she was such a beautiful girl, only 18 years of age, and the communist guerrillas had cut her breasts off because she refused to tell them where her family was. And I thought, well, we're up against a fairly cruel enemy here. This. Uh photograph is back in Venice, I think. And well, I can see that, and I can see that's a Soviet Union looking photograph, at a, uh, a communist yes, photograph. Or it's a uh, poster for a Soviet film that's exhibition. Right. Uh -huh. Did you find the communist presence uh, powerful? Well, it was powerful in propaganda, uh, powerful in money, uh, powerful in its infiltration of labor unions. Uh, and uh, powerful, too, because it identified uh, with basically the principle, the ethics of the West rather than the East. I mean, uh, they were for free elections, and when they came into power, they had no elections. They were for democracy. When they came into power, they'd have dictatorship. Uh, they were for nationalism, they said. Uh, for example, they identified it with Garibaldi. Uh, he was the hero in uh, Italy, who would have turned over in his grave if he thought totalitarians were using his name. They identified in this case, I think, with uh, the great lions of, uh, that you see in the great square at Venice. Uh, and so, as they identified with independence, when they come into power, they imposed communist colonialism, which was worse than the colonialism uh, before. Uh, but it was, it was enormously effective propaganda. Why do you think you were good at foreign affairs? You had never been abroad before except in the war. You had uh, come from a relatively uh, uh, isolated, uh, if not provincial, town in Southern California. You'd, have, you'd had limited exposure to world affairs, and yet uh, from the very beginning you seemed to have an instinct mm -hmm. or an intuition for it, which certainly carried on through, your, through the rest of your career to the presidency. What, makes, what made you good at it? Well, first, I would say it goes back to my education at, at Whittier. Uh, the study of history, the study of philosophy, uh, the fact that even be long before I went to Whittier that uh, my interest in geography, uh, geography deals with foreign affairs, uh, not just where the countries are and all that sort of thing. Uh, and it also goes back to, frankly, the Quaker background, a, a passion for peace. You know, I, uh, I've been in wars. Uh, I. World War II, of course, and I've been exposed to Korea, and exposed to Vietnam, and so forth and so on as a political leader. Uh, but there, there is nothing that uh, is, uh, has been 
more a motivating force in my life uh, than uh, to do something, whether in my service, whether in the House, the Senate, Vice President, or President, that would make the world possibly more peaceful. Uh, I know many of my critics, probably justifiably based on my record, will say, well, uh, you certainly hadn't acted that way uh, in decision making. Uh, but what I have attempted to do uh, is to be quite uh, pragmatic, uh, recognizing that it isn't enough just to be for peace. Uh, you have to recognize that there are evil forces in the world that are not for peace, that there are aggressive forces, and that unless you stop that aggression, uh, that you are not going to have a real peace. Uh, you have to recognize uh, that uh, if you, in the name of, in of peace now, uh, roll over in front of an aggressor, that may by peace not even in your time, but maybe in our time, but it ensures war at a later time, Munich being the prize example. And so while I was for peace uh, as a Quaker, uh, I suppose it, uh, I must say that I was always against appeasement, not because I was for war, but because I was for peace for the generation, for a century, rather than just peace in my own time. Uh, and that is what motivated me, and consequently going to Europe was an opportunity that was fantastic for me, to see what made the world work, to see what motivated people, uh, to be able to understand them. Beyond your intellectual background, though, it's always struck me and many observers as interesting about you that for someone who in some cases with Americans or in American political situations is uncomfortable or ill at ease, uh, you seem to have an intuitive instinct for foreigners, that you, you know how they think, you say the right thing, you do the right thing, that you can uh, negotiate, uh, you can deal with them in, in, in an intuitive way. Is there any, have you ever thought of, about it in that way? Why? Well, yeah, let me, let me say it, since you apparently are too polite to say it, there are many people that say that I like foreigners better than I do Americans. And there are many people that say that uh, they can't understand when I go abroad, even after the trauma of Watergate and so forth, that I am received so favorably and so well in places like China and France and uh, Austria, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, no, I think, I think maybe that goes back to the early years. Uh, one, of the, one of the great... Uh, benefits, may I say, one of the fallouts of living in that little closed Quaker community was first the exposure uh, to a splendid faculty who had a worldview and not a parochial view, and to grow up with people, with Japanese, uh, with Mexicans, with Koreans, uh, with Chinese. Let me tell you an interesting thing, uh, not that it's particularly relevant to your question, that I recall vividly from my college days. Uh, this is back in 1933-34. At that time, the, Ch the Japanese had invaded China, you know, in Manchuria. And I remember two of my best friends. One was Chinese in the Whittier College class, and the other was Japanese. And they virtually came to blow uh, blows uh, in the floor of our state of our assembly. Uh, these two virtually came to blows uh, in the assembly that we were having when that subject came up. And I could see some of the great forces that fought each other in the world. Now, let's come to the feeling about foreigners. Uh, I think if I identify with them, it's because I see them as people, as individuals, uh, more uh, than uh, simply as sort of impersonal leaders representing nationalistic views. Uh, let me put it more precisely. Uh, everybody is quite aware of my anti-Soviet attitudes, my anti-communist attitudes, but, but when I went to the Soviet Union in 1959, along with Pat, I insisted, and uh, it was hard to do, but I insisted uh, uh, from the Russians that I have the opportunity to go into plants, to meet people, to go down the streets, and so forth and so on. Now, of course, they fenced me off pretty good, but I found that the Russian people were warm, and strong. They're people that I wanted on our side rather than the other side. They're good people. I admire them. The same with the Chinese. Uh, uh, when I went there, a great, great, you can think of China of a billion people. You can think of them as Maoists. You can think of them 
as hopeless communists and so forth, or very foreign, or you can think of them for what they really are. They're really, frankly, more like us than the Russians, uh, because they laugh somewhat similarly at the same jokes. Uh, some way or other, uh, I'm quite simpatico with the Chinese, with the Russians as well, but in a different way. I guess what we're really saying here is that, that fundamentally, uh, I think every individual counts, and I think that whether it's in China or Russia or Indonesia uh, or Ghana uh, or Cairo, uh, wherever you go, uh, that if you can break past the official structures and get to see the people, and particularly the people not of the elite class, the elite class this is the same all over the world. Uh, they go to the same parties and they drink the cocktails, etc., and they. They have the same snobbish characteristics uh, any place, and they're not, and frankly, although I have many friends among them, they're not my dish of tea. Uh, but if you can get down and you meet the shopkeepers and the workers and the students and the rest, really get to talk to them, you'll find that there is out there a great common bond that brings us all together. And now I'm speaking a bit too idealistic for the pragmatists I'm supposed to be, but that is the only way uh, we eventually are going to uh, bring this world together. It seems that in the last uh, several months, the relationship with China that you forged and opened as uh, opened and forged as president has been drifting and uh, loosening, and the Chinese, in fact, are talking with the Soviets. Is a Sino-Soviet rapprochement possible, and are we doing the right things to prevent it now? It's possible, and I would say, on the contrary, that uh, we should not openly try to prevent it. Uh, the, uh, I don't think that a rapprochement is going to come, not soon, because they have such great differences about Afghanistan, about Vietnam, about the Soviet forces on the northern Chinese border, and because they have great historical differences. The Russians and the Chinese don't like each other very well. Uh, for reasons we don't need to go into, but it's there, and either side will tell you that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some of our more stupid, uh, or I should say obtuse observers uh, on our side, they say, wouldn't it be great if the Russians and the Chinese had a good fight, and then both of our communist enemies would eat themselves up? Wouldn't be great at all. Let us suppose that the Russians jump the Chinese. What are we going to do? China is supposed to be our, quote, friend, end quote. Do we go to war with Russia in order to save China? I hope that doesn't ever confront an American president. It's a tough question. Second point, when you have two major powers, believe me, if war comes between two major powers like China and Russia, it cannot be contained. It will spread. It will become a world war. So it's in our interest not to have these differences between the two to be exacerbated to the point that it gives the Russians uh, an excuse for a preemptive strike. It's better to cool it to an extent. Now that's one side of the coin. On the other side of the coin, it's just stupid uh, for us to take the Chinese Association for granted and to say that we can do anything we want uh, in terms of our relations with Taiwan or what have you. Uh, because they have no other place to go. They do have some place else to go. They are still communists, and speaking of the leadership. Uh, and uh, under the circumstances, if they give up on us, if they think that the relationship with us economically and otherwise is not worth their while, they may turn that way. So, but I guess I come back to the fundamental point. We should seek good relations with both China and Russia due to the fact they're both great people, due to the fact that it would be a better world for us and for them if we could reduce our, the level of arms, trade with each other, and know each other. That's looking at the idealistic situation. Uh, as far as the Chinese are concerned, and this is the way I would describe it best, if you were to take the Soviet Union and bodily pick it out of the world and you had left uh, the rest of the world, it would still be in the interest of the United States to seek good relations with China because there are a billion P Chinese. They have enormous natural resources. That's one-fourth of all the people in the world. And the future of the world in the next century is going to be greatly affected by the Chinese because they're a very capable people, potentially. 
So I would say, let's seek good relations with them and not just look upon it in a narrow parochial sense where we've got to have good relations with China because we'll play the China card against the Russian card. What, uh, if you were counseling Tricia and Julie and Ed and David now, what, uh, what languages should uh, Alexander and Jenny and Christopher learn in school in order to be effective international citizens of the 21st century? English first. Uh, we, we don't really speak English well enough, and I would urge them to, I would urge them to read English. I'd uh, uh, like Churchill to have a love affair with the English language, uh, learn to l read it, communicate with it, both speaking and writing. Uh, beyond that, uh, I would still, and I guess it's because I'm a Francophile, I'd go for French. French is a great language, and, and, and it's great to read the French classics, Rousseau and Voltaire, uh, at all uh, in France. Uh, uh, I would suggest Russian. It's not that difficult, uh, particularly if you learn it phonetically. Chinese I would not suggest because it's too difficult, and the Chinese are very good at speaking English. The Chinese can learn English e easier than the Japanese, that's the way. So it's done. So that's the way I would look at it at the moment. You've uh, recently written a book on leaders, called Leaders. How do you analyze yourself as a leader? What's, what's your strongest point as a leader? <laughs> well, you know, I'm, uh, I've never believed that uh, any individual can analyze himself. Uh, I know that's the hip thing these days, and that's what you learn in political science classes, and that's what you learn in psychology classes, and, and I know that everybody's supposed to sit about and around in rap sessions and say, well, these are my weaknesses, these are my strengths, true confessions and all that stuff. But it's always turned me off. Uh, I don't think I'm really very good at it. Uh, now, having said that, I would say my, the, the, the first, I'll put it more in a general sense, the most important asset that a leader can have is to believe deeply in a great cause. Uh, that is overlooked too often in the political science course. They tell you how to win, how to be better on television, how to communicate better, uh, how you poll, how you play this group and this group and this group and this group. But in the final analysis, unless an individual is motivated by a great cause, he must know it, he must believe it, he's not going to be able to motivate others. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the factors that has helped me is that, that I have been had a great interest in foreign affairs, uh, that I have wanted to put it in the vernacular, give history a nudge, hopefully in uh, the right direction in terms of building a more peaceful world, not just for the present but for the future, uh, and that I have become somewhat expert uh, in that area. Not a true expert in any sense of the word, but somewhat more expert than others. I think that's been the major factor. Uh, now, as far as other things are concerned, I think most people would give me rather low grades as far as, what do they call, charisma and uh, gregariousness and uh, uh, all that sort of thing that uh, the politician is supposed to have. Uh, the other thing is, of course, I guess another factor where I am reasonably strong is in terms of discipline, uh, discipline thinking, discipline writing. Uh, it, it doesn't mean just hard work, but it means uh, it means working hard in an organized way where you know the priorities. Uh, don't waste your time on things that are not the most important. Have you ever wished that you had more conventional charisma? Oh, not at all. Not at all. Because I've never been one of those charisma nuts. Uh, I think there's far much too emphasis, far much, uh, far too much emphasis on this business. Is the individual charismatic? Uh, I'm more interested in what does he believe? Uh, how, uh, what are, uh, how effective is he in implementing those beliefs? Uh, and I think that uh, one of the curses of the modern television age uh, is that it puts far too much attention on appearance rather than substance, on froth uh, rather than uh, what the beer is really like. Uh, no, I, uh, I've, I've never had any regrets about uh, that people don't think I'm a charismatic figure. 
you've had such an incredible and such an incredibly long career with uh, amazing agonies and amazing ecstasies. Do you feel that you were carrying out a destiny, that there is a destiny for you? Well, up to this time, yes. Uh, I think it can, I think that what I said uh, in Shanghai at the conclusion of our Chinese trip that uh, in 1972, that this is a trip that has changed the world, or a week that has changed the world, I think that is true. Uh, whether that will be dissipated as a result of mismanagement or what have you in the years ahead, I don't know, but I think the world has been changed, and I think for the better, uh, putting it quite bluntly. Uh, if we had not had the new relationship with China, Dangerous as the world appears to be now, with the Russians having gained superiority over us in strategic land-based nuclear weapons, it would be infinitely more dangerous if one billion Chinese were looking toward them rather than being at least neutral and sometimes looking toward us. So I think we've helped there, not just vis-a-vis -vis the Russians, but in building a more peaceful world. One hundred years from now, when Jenny's and Alexander's and Christopher's children's friends say to them, oh, your great-grandfather was uh, President Nixon. Who? How will they fill in that blank? President Nixon who? Well, it depends on what, hi uh, what happens in history. Uh, there's not much I can do in there what remains of my life to affect that. Uh, but uh, uh, Claire Booth Luce once said uh, that uh, uh, and this was before the Watergate business. This was right after the China trip. She said, historically, a thousand years from now, he said, there will be only one line. That's all that's needed with regard to your career. He went to China. And uh, now, that could change, however, because let us suppose that the Chinese relationship is uh, sours. Let us suppose they go the other way. Uh, then the fact that I went to China, all it did uh, was simply buy us some time, which is important. Uh, I would hope that a hundred years from now that uh, the world would be a safer place. Uh, if it is, I think we would have contributed to it during our administration by not only what we did with regard to China, but what we got, did with regard to a, a different relationship uh, uh, with the Soviet Union. Uh, detente, I know, as practiced in the Carter administration has gotten to be a bad word, but as practiced in our administration, uh, it resulted in some liberalization in Eastern Europe. Uh, it resulted in some lessening of tensions. Uh, and if reinstituted on a hard-headed basis by uh, administrations in the future, a relationship with Russia, I think, can be developed, which will avoid war and even more important, avoid surrender to blackmail. Let me ask you a question, the kind of question I know you hate. Um, how, if you had to, in 25 words or less, describe Richard Nixon, what 25 words or less would you choose? Well, that's one that I probably not only would hate to answer, but one that I simply am unable to do. Uh, if, if I had time to sit down and write it out, maybe I could answer it, but I don't think I could do it now. If you uh, could have been present at, uh, at any event in history, what event would most have interest you, interested, would most interest you to put yourself back in time to watch as a, uh, as a fly on the wall? Well, I would, I mean, anybody would have to say uh, who uh, had the Christian background, you'd want to be present at the birth of Christ. Uh, that, of course, was uh, the great event of uh, certainly what we know now as modern civilization. Uh, no event in history has had more effect. I mean, some of the effects have been bad, uh, as anybody who reads The Decline and the Fall of the Roman Empire would agree, although Gibbon, of course, went much too far in blaming all the ills uh, that followed, <laughs> that befell the Roman Empire on the Christians. Uh, but on the other hand, the way that uh, uh, 
the life of Christ affected millions uh, is something that has not happened, of course, since and had not happened before. Uh, whether it will have lasting effect for the future, I, I'm not able to say. If you could give a, uh, you're going tonight uh, when you leave here to a dinner party, if you could invite three or four people from all of past history and excluding the founders uh, of the great religions, who, who would be at your historical dinner party that you would like to listen to their conversation? Well, I, I, I think I'd go pretty much to more of the modern ones. Maybe Churchill. Uh, well, I'd like to have in the same room Churchill and de Gaulle, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Lincoln, of course, uh, maybe Jefferson because he was more interesting. Uh, I, he wasn't my favorite of the founding fathers, but he'd be more interesting than some of the others. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, without question, uh, these among the Americans. Uh, going back, uh, Napoleon, naturally, not because he waged war so successfully, but because his Napoleonic code and what he did in Europe was so important. In terms of the, um, well, a Voltaire, a, a marvelous uh, conversationalist, you couldn't miss him. Uh, Augustine, St. Augustine, and of course uh, when you get to the Greeks and the Romans and so forth, uh, I suppose you talk about Cicero and others. It's, uh, it's, a, it's uh, quite a smorgasbord to pick from. Will you invite me? Oh, oh you yes, would be I included. I you left my you, name off the list, uh, but I assume that's because... No, uh, these are only, they're all dead. That's right. And uh, that's you're right. still walking around that's even right. though you may be dead. Well, I, I think I've actually even survived the, uh, the second of these sessions. <laughs> We need to change tape. It'll take uh, five minutes. We can still take for another 45 minutes. Before we move off the set, however, I would like to have absolute quiet in the studio. We're going to use your microphone, fellas, just to record about 30 seconds of room tone for editing purposes. So uh, just everybody hold tight and see if they can hear you back. See, we should now finish at 3. I can be down there at 3.30. That's right. Okay, here we go. Uh, we're going to record room tone quiet for 30 seconds. 